Good morning, everybody. Uh, thanks for being here again. Um, uh, first of all, uh, I, well, we want to tell you that uh, we know about two people missing today, uh, two speakers missing. Um, so one is uh, Athena Mara, she will not be here. Uh, in, uh, she's in par she was supposed to be in parallel session seven, law and public policy. And then also from the session 11, Sorola Senge Parenthood, Corina Gonzoni will not be with us. And we hope that all the other people could be here. Um, so now, back to us. Um, I'm glad and proud to introduce this panel on medical uh, assisted reproduction. We will start with uh, Beatrice Guzmano, who will talk about um, her research study in Italy. Uh, the title of her presentation is Brave Intersectionality, Non-Heterosexual Mothers Accessing Arts in Italy. Uh, good morning. Um, I will go straight to the point. That is that coming out as mother and non heterosexual in Italy is a great challenge. Since in Italy there is no legal recognition for parenting outside the monogamous borders of heteronormativity. In fact, same sex civil unions were recognized in Italy only last year, but the law doesn't take into consideration any aspect of parenting. To ensure passage in the Senate, the original version of the law was watered down by excluding a clause that would have allowed to adopt partner's children, the so-called stepchild adoption. Therefore, the only way to co-adopt partner's child is, is through a case-by-case -case sentence by courts that usually appeal to the law on special adoption. Moreover, according to Law 40, 2004, on medical assisted reproduction, only married or cohabitating heterosexual couples which certifies sterility or infertility can access ARTs in Italy. Therefore, non-heterosexual and single women uh, go abroad and they face recognition limits once the child is born. Concerning the sample, I've interviewed only six women, age 40-48, who directly went through medically assisted reproduction. Claudia is a lesbian single mother uh, she went uh, once in Spain and through an uh, intrauterine insemination had two twins, Alma and Sofia. Eliana is a lesbian uh, woman united in a, with a civil partnership with Sandra. She went to Spain four times and four unsuccessful times and then she got Marti they got Martina through an uh, uh, intracytoplasmic sperm injection. Chiara is a lesbian uh, woman, she's divorced from Tiziana and they went to Spain uh, three times. The first one was uns unsuccessful through an in vitro fertilization and with the second to IVF they had Carlo and Tommaso. Federica is a lesbian single mother, she went to Denmark <coughs> three times uh, and she tried twice with a do-it-yourself te technique in Italy and finally, she got Diego through an IVF in Spain. And Rebecca is a self-identified bisexual woman, and she's married uh, in Spain to Deborah. And they tried four times an IUE uh, that was unsuccessful, in the, and then they had Valentino through an IVF. <coughs> in this presentation, I'd like to show how different systems of oppre oppression, such as heteronormativity, ageism, institutional homophobia, and class, are, um, make it even harder for non-heterosexual women to become mothers and to be recognized as such. Here, I am talking about intersectionality, recognizing some of the privileges held by the women I have interviewed, because they all have a job, and when coupled, both of them have a job, they have a white social network, they are able-bodied, and they are all white and Italian. At the same time, they face different systems of oppression, as I was saying before. So I've decided to read all these dynamics through the lens of what I've called mono-motherhood. 
Uh, I was inspired by Brigitte Vassallo when she, she states that monogamy is not just a practice, but it's a way of thinking. So the monogamous thought based on exclusivity and exclusion is a way of organizing relational and private life. According to this monogamous paradigm, I define monomotherhood as the regime that recognizes just one mother and just one way of being an appropriate mother. Therefore, monomotherhood involves two concepts. The first one is the Italian say di mamma ce n'è una sola, that could be translated into mom, we only get one. And this heteronormative saying immediately erases the possibility of two mothers raising a child and poses a burden on the intentional mother in order to justify her relationship with the child. And then the second concept is the fact that there is just one legitimate way of being a mother, the one that is inscribed in a heteronormativity. Along the presentation, I will show how interviewed mothers cope with these systems of oppression, struggling both for legal and social recognition. And this struggle is not just about themselves, but it's about their lesbian or bisexual identity, their intimate relationship or their single status, the filiation bond between intentional mother and the child, and their family as a whole. The first common topic within interviewees' experiences is the stereotype and heteronormative assumption according to which a lesbian can't be a mother. Some of the reasons, uh, like uh, Chiara is saying in the first quote, I used to think that a pure lesbian couldn't have children. I didn't want to go to rainbow families meetings because I didn't feel at ease. It was a little bit of internalized homophobia, you know? Some of the reasons of this internalized homophobia are linked with the fact of being raised within homophobic Catholicism. As Claudia says, Catholicism takes root where there is nothing. The alternative choice is Catholicism or boredom. For me, being gay and Catholic was devastating. Or other reasons are link, linked with non-supportive families of origin. As Rebecca says, talking about Deborah, her wife, she said, Deborah used to deny herself the possibility of creating a family because, unlike me, she had experienced her family's prejudice. Or other, um, other reasons are linked with stereotypes concerning homosexuality. As Claudia says, in the 70s in Italy, it was already an achievement to accept homosexuality. Accepting motherhood within homosexuality was just the discovery of America. Or uh, other, other stereotypes uh, are linked with the fear of raising a child in a homophobic world. And Rebecca says, not having a legal protection frightened me so much. For me, it was like a deadlock for years. Therefore, heteronormativity is strengthened by internalized homophobia that increases without social and legal recognition. Many women think it's impossible to, to be a lesbian woman and a mother at the same time. And Rebecca says, there is a sense of precarity, the very precarity that comes from the fact of not being recognized. When the couple or the single woman decide to face all the consequences of heteronormativity and not for accessing the long path of medically assisted reproduction, they face other kinds of delegitimation. First of all, I show different stereotypes that apply for the concept of monomotherhood, trying to pass down how this delegitimation affects women's identity. <coughs> the first one is the fact that motherhood is a biological destiny for every woman. And Federica says, my gynecologist told me, remember that when you give birth, you pass from adolescence to be a woman. And I said, well, I mean at 45, <laughs> And then another topic is the importance of blood ties, what is called also resilience of biology. biology. And Eliana says, I remember a sad thing. Deborah's sisters called me and told me that this child was not her sister's child, but it was just my child because they had nothing of their blood. Or the fact that there could be just one mother. In our situation together, uh, I was immediately set as his mother. There was no room for doubt. So in severe cases, she became the grandmother. In less serious cases, the aunt. 
And Rebecca goes on with the story because uh, since her partner is older than she, the oldest is never recognized as the mother. And she says, Deborah experiences yet another problem re related to her being a woman, not only in terms of being the second parent, that usually is a man's role, but also because she can hardly be seen as the biological mother, given that visually, clearly, when Valentino was born, Deb was 45 years old. And the last, the last point is the fact that the less feminine is never thought as the mother. And Claudia talks about her previous experience and says, it also springs from the stereotypes that Italy is strongly imbued with. As part of the couple, I've always been the figure, the one a little more masculine, no? So I could almost not even see myself, paradoxically, with the pregnant belly. The mono-motherhood regime entails a long list of the legitimations toward the intentional mother that compromises her identity as a parent. Moreover, a defensive strategy linked with the fear of being discriminated against involves invisibility practices that could lead to conflict within the couple. In order to exit heteronormativity and repronormativity, some of those mothers found help in psychotherapy to conciliate motherhood and lesbianism, as Federica says in the first quote. Others found help in seeing, in attending Rainbow Families meeting, as Chiara says in the second quote, or in seeing other homosexuals, couples, parenting. And Federica recalls, I also told my parents about other women's experience and that knowing other women who had done it helped me a lot to say, you can do it. Or thanks to the support of dissident people working within the Christian church, met in LGBT groups dealing with faith. As Chiara says, first of all, I looked for Christian groups of Christian homosexuals to realize that finding alternative roads to combine faith and homosexuality was possible. So it was an encounter, you know, just one of those crucial days in life. The second excerpt is about the meeting with an Italian well-known priest who was dismissed from his clerical status due to dissent with the Catholic Church. He admitted heterosexual second marriages, argued against celibacy for priests, and blessed same-sex marriages. And, and Claudia said, I was lucky enough to know Don Franco Barbero. But you're so beautiful, but what's wrong with who you are? He told me. It was really, do you know inner freedom? Feeling loved for who you are in your uniqueness. So notwithstanding the stereotype visions of lesbianism and motherhood, we need to, to acknowledge that the process of categorizing is not unilateral. Clearly, there is an equal power, but identity continue to, continues to be a site of resistance. The starting point of any discussion concerning institutional homophobia is the fact that lesbianism and bisexuality are still invisibilized and delegitimized identities in contemporary Italy. As I argued elsewhere, non-heterosexual people can face compulsory invisibility when they come out, as happened to the mothers I've interviewed. And Rebecca says, Deborah said, Mom, Rebecca and I are together. I spent eight summers at Deborah's mother's. Ah, but aren't you friends? Mom, but I am homosexual. Since when? Since I was 16. She's 50 now. <laughs> so this same invisibilization of lesbian identity entails a strong need for recognition concerning sexual orientation and single mother identity, showing how coming out with the family could be empowering as it happened to Federica. To have started this path of truth, authenticity, and clarity, even with my family, it makes me feel so free. And you know, I feel very centered. That is, I'm not afraid of anything. And I say it with great pride after what I worked my butt off to get to him. On the other hand, to him, to his son. On the other hand, concerning women who decide to parent with their partner, Interviewees read that choice as a shared project made possible just because of the existence of a couple relationship. At the same time, they admit the total absence of recognition concerning their relational rights, those on which they base their daily choice. 
It's in their daily practices that lesbian and bisexual mothers realize how any tiny event could unveil the condition of outsider, both of their child or partner. The only entitled subject is the biological mother, as expressed by Rebecca when recalling the day in which same-sex civil unions were approved without the recognition of stepchild adoption. They came together, the sweetness of Valentino and the harshness of the law. The fact that civil unions were approved without stepchild adoption was a drama at home. Valentino would have been born anyhow. If you recognize it or not, it changes nothing to you, the state. To us, it changes the world. On the major, one of the major worries is the relation with public institutions. Visibility becomes the instrument through which they create a welcome environment for children. Actually, it is not just visibility, it's a struggle that these women face daily in order to change little by little the level of inclusivity for their children, something that any parent with children outside the norm knows, being the norm, uh, the whiteness, Catholic religion, ability, heterosexuality, and so on. And Rebecca uh, recalls when she was at the hospital, she gave birth. At one point, uh, the, um, the nurse, the nurse said, we have to close. Deborah told her, yes, but here I see that fathers stay. And she said, fathers only. And Deborah replied, consider me as a father. Therefore, interview mothers uh, exit their condition of invisible, lesbian, bisexual, single motherhood in order to be active subjects claiming rights. They become activists, even though the majority of them was never active within social movements because, as Eliana said, she is against association and flags are not for her. But she wanted to see with her partner <coughs> how the children were doing. And um, <coughs> therefore, the life of, hom of homosexual parents is scattered with legal preventive me measures. They need to keep the evidences of the existence of a family, such as flight tickets, hotel reservations, etc., in order to protect the bond between the intentional mother and the child, as Eliana says in, in, the, in the quote. An alternative is to get married abroad and take the residence there in order to grant the double surname to children. Therefore, this lack of legal recognition can be, can be overcome just depending on the economic and social capital of lesbian and bisexual mothers. These two experts was, were always taken into consideration before accessing a RTS. The fact of not being legally recognized entails an exacerbation of class material conditions. Concerning lesbian and gay parenting, according to Taylor, the dominant narrative has been the one of choice, sometimes hiding the class conditions that allow for the mobilizations of resources to access ARTS. Here, I will focus precisely on those material conditions. All interviewees admit that their work conditions allow them to access ARTS abroad, thanks to work colleague support, to their ability to manage their employment in order to go back and forth to clinics, to their precarious but flexible jobs, or to their self-employment. Moreover, one of them received benefits once pregnant thanks to her job in the public sector. Starting from this requirement of employment and flexibility, we should look at the too often taken for granted aspect, the access to information that is not so widespread in the Italian heteronormative landscape. All interviewed women admit that access to internet was the prime source of information. Moreover, in internet is deemed fundamental after the childbirth to keep in contact with families of origin and families of choice. Even though it might seem incredible in 2016, access to internet is not uniform across Italy, especially in small towns that already lack LGBT associations, which contributes to isolating even more LGBT people who want uh, to travel the road of ARTS. Beyond the access to information, economic ponderations were made concerning the maximum numbers of tries we had with ARTS, a topic that deals with desire, sacrifice, and the emotional cost of success. Moreover, there are other associated costs. 
flights, hotel reservations, checkups, monitoring, unexpected travels, depending on the development of eggs and ovulation, as Rebecca says in the quote. Finally, given the heteronormative bias of law 42004 that denies access to ARTs to single or lesbian mothers, interviewed women took into consideration the cost of prescriptions and medicines as well. Luckily, interviewees could count on their social capital with a wide network of friends and work colleagues who had them while abroad, giving them medicine for free or at a lower cost, offering discounts in checkups and so on. Moreover, they found some health professionals willing to mediate with health systems discriminations, giving apparent institutional recognition to the family project. All these discriminations, though, are bare by lesbian and bisexual mothers and couples who take the risk of ending in the procreative tunnel as it was defined by one of the interviewees. So, getting to conclusions, in a country where heteronormativity still defines the legitimate relational and parental bonds, the challenges posed to the, con by the, con to the concept of monomotherhood could help in escaping from this doomed destiny. Interviewed mothers show how they reconquer motherhood. As women, they were supposed to mother. As lesbians or bisexual women, they were supposed, supposed not to mother. Seeing a had homosexual parents, they started to think about motherhood again. Recognition happens on the basis of what is legitimized from a social and a legal point of view. Due to institutional homophobia, interviewed mothers try over and over to reaffir reaffirm different kinds of bonds, their intimate relationship with the partner, their lesbian or bisexual identity as single mothers, the filiation bond between the intentional mother and the child, and their family as a whole. Concerning class and narratives of choice, we should be aware that choice needs to be read as the output of economic economic capital and social networks that affect how we cope with different systems of oppression. Maybe <clears throat> instead of talk or referring to the resilience of biology, we should talk about the resilience of heteronormativity. Here, the concept of intersectionality is useful to give an account of how heteronormativity affects maternity choices for lesbian or bisexual interviewed mothers in a context in which there is an ongoing delegitimation of non-heterosexual existence. The fact that these women are aware of the intersectionality of discriminations allows them to be considered experts in respect with all women who want to access ARTS. As reported by many respondents, Italian heterosexual couples met in clinics abroad are ashamed of having to resort to ARTS demonstrating how heteronormativity linked to the resilience of biology has harmful, harmful consequences on them as well. It is in these identity gaps that it is possible to build coalitions, even temporary, temporarily, that go beyond mere, le mere levels to, in order to find strategies to address structure, different structures of oppression and discrimination. So, thank you. And now it's Anna Cristina. Anna Cristina Santos Turn. Um, she will present the Portuguese part of the research. And the representation is Repronormativity and its others, Reproductive Dissidence of Lesbian and Bisexual Mothers in Lisbon. Teamwork. Uh, good morning. In the aftermath of the sexual revolution of the 1960s, sexuality and reproduction seem to be, finally, two separate categories. However, when the topic is same-sex parenting, the link between sexuality and reproduction seems magnified, retaining much cultural significance. In this paper, I challenge the assumption that sexuality and reproduction are culturally disentangled. This assumption is challenged based on two apparently conflictive grounds. On one hand, in southern European countries, sexuality has been considered an impeding factor in law for accessing reproductive and parenting rights for LGBT people. On the other hand, lesbian and bisexual mothers often report that pregnancy was the moment when they decided to come out to relatives and other important people. 
Together, these two factors uncover the contradictions of a legal framework which deprives subjects from reproductive agency based on sexuality, at the same time that the very same subjects feel culturally endorsed when they join the reproductive ladder. Therefore, legitimacy to access parenting is both questioned and reinforced by sexuality, even if in contradictory ways. So, this paper is divided in three sections. First, uh, we explore the cultural context in which the motherhood regime, understood as both reproduction and parenting, is embedded in Portugal. Then, we consider biographic narrative interviews conducted with lesbian and bisexual mothers in Lisbon in 2016, with a particular focus on participants' encounters with dominant ideologies of motherhood. Finally, a reading of queer that can be used in future reproductive studies will be advanced. It is suggested that in Southern Europe, where reproduction and parenting have been historically constrained by strict rules around gender and sexuality, failing to be a particular kind of heteronormative, cisnormative, mononormative mother may offer a fruitful way for decolonizing reproduction by embracing reproductive misfits. We'll get there. The motherhood regime. So, uh, Southern European countries are described in literature on welfare and gender regimes as embodiments of family-oriented, procreative and heteronormative states. Despite changes, cultural expectations encourage linearity in intimate biographies. For instance, after reaching adulthood, one finds a partner, gets formal recognition, that is marriage, and has biological children. Therefore, by becoming a mother, lesbian and bisexual women are, allegedly, joining the universe of normativities they had once allegedly rejected when they refused the heteronormative script. What I suggest to call uh, the motherhood regime of any given country is a set of cultural expectations around parenting anchored in tradition and translated into legal, political and social practices. According to the dominant motherhood regime in Portugal, women are primarily and above all mothers. Current or forthcoming, but certainly caring, skillful, willing, resourceful, delighted supermoms. An interesting example of how law and social policy are constitutive of the motherhood regime is the focus on work-life balance embodied to a large extent by state feminism and gathering a substantial part of the scholarly feminist work in Portugal in the 90s. But reality is telling us a more nuanced story. 30.2. This is the average age at which women in Portugal become mothers. Official statistical data from 2013 reveals that 35% of all women aged between 18 and 49 did not have biological children. This somehow challenges gendered expectations around women's self-fulfillment and parenting, as well as the natural link between women and motherhood, opening the space for, the space for reappraising the cultural features of procreation. Indeed, the exploration of relational diversity, including non-monogamies, singledom, solo living, opens the door to the questioning of the reproductive script and what it entails, especially for women. Repronormativity is an ideological force that narrows down the reproductive and parental potential to its dominant and hegemonic version. In the intimate project, our understanding of repronormativity is anchored on heteronormative expectations around reproduction and parenting. And this aspect is particularly important in the southern European context, in which same-sex parenthood has traditionally met more resistance and backlash than the recognition of marriage or other forms of partnering. Moms strike back. So, this section draws heavily on the narratives and practices of self-identified lesbian and bisexual women aged between 35 and 45, interviewed in Lisbon between April and July 2016. All participants had a university degree, were partnered, and parenting had been a couple-based couple decision. Some topics emerged from the narrative interviews as particularly significant, and those are the ones you have in the slide and we'll uh, see each, uh, each one of them now. 
lesbian and bisexual moms um, displayed strong concerns with age and these acquired different formats. First, the age of the prospective gestational parents plays a significant role in the decision-making process. This is often referred to as something banal, self-evident, internalized as natural. So things like, I'm in a hurry, couldn't wait anymore, it's now or never, uh, we were almost reaching the expiry date, along these lines. Reflections about one's age are sometimes accompanied by evaluations on good or bad parenting. According to the retro-normative script, a good mother is never too old. This is an interesting quote. I felt that at 36 I couldn't wait much more, because I mean, not only for the physical process, but also because, I mean, I want to have a child, not a grandchild, right? 36. Other questions um, emerging from the interviews were related with who was perceived by the couple as being fit to become a mom, who presented highest uh, chances of being successfully pregnant at first attempt, and what was the age limit to access art according to formal or tacit rules. Being partnered, the duration and quality of the relationship seemed to be a crucial aspect when deciding to become a parent through art. This connection between partnering and parenting highlights the structured character of coupledom with a tendency to replicate linear times of intimacy. We were together already for X years, in the right time, the next logic step, and so on. Reproductive materialities. The material aspects of reproduction were central in narratives produced by participants who displayed much concern with costs associated with reproductive displacement and the high price of the health treatments uh, involved, the health procedures involved. At other times, interviewees connected certain moments to the self-realization of the mothering project. Some of these consisted of a particular conversation with their partner, um, this is a particularly moving um, trend, excerpt uh, when, when the interview described um, they were house hunting for a house to rent and then at some point she tells her partner there's a room missing. There was a room missing and I asked myself but why would I want another room? Ah, oh, I want a child. I so want a child. That's why I tell you that my son started there. This son, who was never born, started when I first, first saw that house, the house I never rented because it lacked one room for him. For several women asking for a budget, the implant, the sonogram, uh, represented the moment in which the parental project became real. Symbolic objects mentioned during the interviews varied widely from scans to baby clothes, pregnancy tests, uh, which were kept as powerful reminders of the reproductive achievement. In other cases, the birth became the moment of the reproductive uh, materialization. Uh, there were also um, important aspects related to emotional costs, the impact on, on coupledom uh, after, after a pregnancy. Reproductive misfits. Despite speaking from the position of intended parents, the feeling of inadequacy or perplexity when faced with parental roles and expectations emerged at times. For the purposes of this paper, I borrow the notion of misfit, originally coined by Garland Thompson in the context of feminist disability theory, and that describes someone who does not seem to belong to a group or is not accepted by a group because of being different in some ways. Interviewees referred moments in which they felt or were in the position of feeling reproductive misfits. Such feeling was sometimes connected to the resilience of biology, namely blood ties, that authorized relatives, friends, co-workers or neighbors to act according to a tacit hierarchy through which the gestational mom and her parents is the real mom and grandparents. Sometimes the misfits seem to be caused or aggravated by the absence of adequate conceptual tools which could better describe the non-gestational mom and the grandparents. So, um, one interviewee, she referred to this, she says, even me, I understand that the mother is the one who gives birth, but there's no alternative name for me, if there was another name, but there, there isn't. 
and she describes how she was made to feel awkward when she was attending um, childbirth classes and at some point the instructor asked the, the dads to leave the room, only moms would stay and initially she wasn't sure whether this applied to her, then she decided to leave the room and all the men ignored her and this was one of the very few times in which she felt um, wrong, she felt awkward as a, as a parent, that she didn't belong somehow. In other narratives, the feeling of misfit is linked to a disclosure, disclosure of origins to children, namely the absence of a male procreator. Um, in line with this, uh, there were also reports that linked the idea of reproductive misfits to sexual orientation, most specifically of how having a lesbian relationship was considered an impeding factor for mothering, in line with what uh, Beatrice was also saying. So it never crossed our minds, the idea of having a child. Uh, these topics offer an important opportunity to discuss the cultural entanglements between sexuality and reproduction, one of the assumptions that this paper takes issue with. Indeed, until 2016, the Portuguese legal framework deprived subjects from reproductive agency based on the sexual orientation and or gender identity of end users, at the same time that the very same subjects felt culturally endorsed when they joined the reproductive uh, ladder. So moving to uh, the final section of this paper. Queer in reproductive studies or the queer art of failed mothering. Now we move to popular culture, into a very uh, Hollywood-esque uh, movie. In 2016, Hollywood blockbuster Bad Moms, uh, Amy, a 32-year-old, recently divorced and exhausted mother of two, decides she has had enough and starts a revolution. Backed up by Carla, a seductive single mom, and Kiki, a shy woman with four children and who describes herself as not having any friends, Amy runs for PTA president against impeccable, rich, and never late Gwedolin, someone who is depicted as a perfect mom and who had been re-elected president of the past six years. In her final statement, just before election, Amy makes the decisive speech and she says, the truth is, when it comes to being a mom, I have no clue as to what I'm doing. And you know what? I don't think anyone does. I think we're all bad moms. And you know why? Because being a mom today is impossible. Crowd cheers and support. So can we all please stop pretending like we have it figured, figured it out, I hate to say this, uh, and stop judging each other for once? End of quote. The crowd is surprisingly supportive. And one by one, other moms in the room attending the meeting stand and confess things they did or did not, and that could be considered as bad mothering according to dominant standards. Things related to junk food or excessive TV time. Two of those bad motherish statements stand out as particularly challenging and unexpected in the line of testimonials, and these are the ones chosen to end the series of testimonies. One mom, who the audience will read as a lesbian woman, says, I like my, na my nanny better than I like my husband, to her husband's dismay sitting beside her. The, yeah, the guy says, no, really. <laughs> and the women burst in applause. The lesbian mom is followed by another woman who stands and declares, I don't even have kids, I just come to these meetings because I'm lonely. <laughs> followed by shy and embarrassed applause. Amy, our good mom, bad, Amy wins the election for PTA president against Gwendolyn. And her motto throughout the campaign was mom's and children's right to do less, less meetings, less homework, less hours, the ability to make mistakes, to get it wrong, to not having it all figured out. In a 10-hour flight between Madrid and Bogota in November, Avianca Airlines advertised the movie as a comedy. And I quote, when three moms are pushed beyond their limits, they ditch their conventional responsibilities for a jolt of freedom, fun, and com comedic self-indulgence. End of quote. 
Arguably, this simplistic description betrays what could be seen as a queer feminist aim of the movie, dismissing women's rightful critique to repronormativity as a mere jolt of fun and comedic self-indulgence. Fun and indulgence is not what serious, committed moms do. Ditching your responsibilities for a bit of fun and indulgence is for spoiled, selfish and reckless adults or kids. Therefore, the self-description of the movie places women in a subhuman or at least pre-adult positioning. But the movie is more than its poor description. The scene of an admittedly failing mother running against the woman who epitomizes all of the normatives, uh, normativities attached to good motherhood is striking on many levels. For the purposes of the paper, I want to use this scene to prompt our thoughts around the queer art of failed mothering. In a context in which reproduction and parenting are constrained by a set of rules around gender and sexuality, challenging the grounds through which one reproduces and or parents on a daily basis can be, can be interpreted as a queer stance. As such, failing to be a mother or failing to be a particular kind of heteronormative, cisnormative, mononormative mother is as queer as failing to fulfill other dominant expectations. If we return to Amy, her supporters and the two final statements during the election night, the lesbian mom and the lonely uh, fake mom, we see how the many le levels of queer intersect through the failure of parenting. In that scene, we have a recently divorced mom, a single mom, a lesbian or bisexual mom, a lonely woman who attends parents' meetings, women with precarious jobs, women who have uncommitted sex, and women who put an end to unfulfilling relationships, women who are in the process of becoming, of traveling away from the fixed position normative motherhood has ascribed to them. These women capture the queer that stems from not having it all figured out, or from being reproductive dissidents, reproductive misfits. A quote by Munoz. We must strive in the face of the here and now's totalizing rendering of reality, to think and to feel a then and there. Some will say that all we have are the pleasures of this moment, but we must never settle for the minimal transport. We must dream and enact new and better pleasures, other ways of being in the world, and ultimately new worlds. Queerness is that thing that lets us feel that this world is not enough, and indeed something is missing. The quotidian can contain a map of the utopia that is queerness. The daily encounters with ideologies of motherhood that many of our interviewees share with us contain maps of the utopia that is queerness. Indeed, queer teaches us to value experience, and in so doing, queer creates the space for rejecting ageism and temporal linearity, reframing the material aspects of parenting, or for embracing reproductive misfits, single parents, surrogates, transparents, multi-parents, art moms. So in the final minute, yes? The official story of reproduction as a natural drive, as we know, is deeply ableist, racialized, ageist, heterosexist. To become a mom, one must comply with a set of tacit, when not explicit, rules. Mothers are expected to belong to a particular type of category, not too old, not too young, not too reproductive. It's not good to have too many children. Yeah, there are all sets of interesting things around that. Not too reproductive, not too sexually active, not too sick, not too poor, not too jobless. Mothers are expected to be cisgendered women, monogamous, fertile, able-bodied. Mothers are expected to be happily married to their cohabiting male partner. The heterosexist character of natural reproduction dismissed the reproductive demands of an army of potential parents, such as single people, transgender or gay men, lesbian and bisexual women, polyamorous and other relationally diverse families. In a song called Accidental Babies, a mildly desperate Damien Rice poses a series of Questions. Let's see if this works. Do you together ever feel music? 
darken Enough to see your light Dude. Oh no! Oh, it was also going so well. Okay, for the sake of time, uh, I'll read because he's very slow and it, it, it you know. So, uh, do you brush your teeth before you kiss? Do you miss my smell? Is he bold enough to take you on? Do you feel like you belong? Does he drive you wild, mildly free? What about me? The song proceeds in the same tone and reaches its climax with the following plea. Do you really feel alive without me? If so, be free. If not, leave him for me before one of us has accidental babies for we are in love. So, this somehow anecdotic portrait of a secret love affair is at the opposite end of the accounts provided by our participants in the art study. Reproduction and parenting are taken seriously by art, lesbian and bisexual mothers. The decision to become a parent is thoughtful and discussed thoroughly, often for years before being enacted. They did not become parents by accident. The intended character of reproduction influences the narratives we gathered. The topic of sexual dissidence and parenting can also fulfill an important theoretical and political call for decolonizing motherhood. As Martha Finman's work advances, it is urgent to reconceptualize re re the practice of motherhood, a symbolic space that has been occupied by patriarchal norms. Motherhood is a colonized concept, um, and if an event physically practiced and experienced by women, but occupied and defined, given the content and value, by the core concepts of patriarchal uh, ideology, end of quote. The narratives we collected for the study demonstrate the need to deconstruct the ideology of the biological supermom, a call which is shared with other struggles in the realm of reproductive citizenship, such as compulsory breastfeeding or the increasing visibility of politically regretful moms. Under the constraining um, repronormative lens, lesbians, bisexual, other sexual dissidents continue to have an identity understood as non-reproductive in nature. They are reproductive misfits. Therefore, lesbian and bisexual practices of reproduction and parenting can play a significant role in desacralizing nature. Nature is mutable, diverse, a work in progress. There is nothing intrinsically natural in the decision to have or not to have children, inasmuch as there is nothing intrinsically natural in remaining partnered, single, straight, or relationally diverse. Thank you. Now to conclude, uh, Luciana Moreira uh, talk, will talk about the study in Spain. And her presentation is Universal Rights and Local Values, Lesbian and Bisexual Mothers Negotiating Futurity. Good morning. Um, one of the main slogans used to defend individual and relational rights of queers is LGBT rights are human rights. In fact, the rights of sexual and gender dissident people have been a matter of concern in a number of institutions at both national and European level, but also at the level of international law more in general. 30 years after the end of the dictatorship, Spain was a unique example of respect for the legal rights of lesbian and gay couples, being the third country in the world approving same-sex marriage and giving same-sex couples the right to adopt in 2005. In 2006, both single women or lesbian couples gained access to assisted reproduction techniques. Social movements were crucial here, since the beginning of the 70s for both the end of criminalization legislation and legal equality achievements. What is import important to take into account here is social mobilization in both national and transnational spheres. Within European institutions, the work of activists, social movements and organizations as a transnational level were crucial and the same happened in Spain, with the country becoming an example for human rights of queer people. According to Carmen Calvo, there were some constraints within political parties and the author denounces the very limited presence of, of parliamentary debates and on issues related to the rights of LGBT people until the mid-90s. 
which reinforces the importance of social movements in order to put discrimination based on sexual orientation on political agendas. Nevertheless, regardless of the legal framework for queer people in Spain, it is accepted among Spanish and or Southern European academics and activists that legal equality was not accompanied by an effective change in society. There are measures that should be addressed in what concerns to social and cultural change within the Spanish society. From this point on, I will identify the main resistance to the laws as well as the fears identified by lesbian and bisexual cis women throughout the pregnancy and childbearing process, as well as their strategies of imposing themselves within their families and in society in a more general frame. For this purpose, I will analyze the information collected during the fieldwork in Madrid in 2016 on artificial, artificial reproductive technology with five couple women. My interviewees made constant references to their families of origin. Even if the question they were asked was about assisted reproductive techniques, some women began telling me, or told me later, uh, during the interview, about the moment they came out of the closet to their families of origin, perhaps because they consider it part of the process of one day becoming lesbian or bisexual mothers. For instance, Tasha connects specifically her mother's reaction with the Spanish social context. I asked my mother, wouldn't you defend me? Wouldn't you really stand up for me? Well, no, she wouldn't because of her culture, of her religion, whatever, I don't know. She has a mental block, she couldn't, and I argued a lot, a lot, and we started to, to yell, and I've never yelled at my mother ever. She's a victim too, don't you think, of the society and of the phalangist thought, which was the party uh, during the dictatorship. Um, okay, so. So thought and all the shit they put in her head when she was a child in schools and all. It is clear that she is a woman of her time, but that was very hard. Another good example is Joanna's elaboration uh, on her parents' reaction when her and their partner first told them they were thinking about having children. Their parents are a religious couple that lives in a neighborhood on the outskirts of Madrid where every, everyone knows each other and Juana and their partner are living nearby. For them it was too much. It is not that they have confronted us, but they told us very hard <laughs> things that nobody likes to be told. Then we decided not to say anything about assessing too hard. And once it is done, there is no going back. I was afraid to comment anything, of them trying to discourage me. Not to hurt my parents, in this case, would be hurting myself for all my life and I didn't want that. Maybe I've been a bit selfish, I do not think so. They have made their lives and I have made mine. I am so proud and happy that I tell everyone I can, you fight for what you want and as long as you don't hurt anyone. Because I believe we don't hurt anyone. Everyone lives his life as he or she wants. It is interesting here to try to more deeply understand what lies behind those acts of refusal. One of the most interesting answers is that of Sarah Hamed in The Cultural Politics of Emotion, where she develops the idea of the heteronormative society within the perception of the emotions, both with respect to sexuality, but also regarding, regarding queer forms of parenting. Ahmed denounces that the conception or the projection of parenting within the heteronormative couple is the reproduction of that same heteronormativity in which the girl is thought to be like her mother and the boy is thought to be like his father. In that sense, the children are the future projection of the model in which they live and queer families suffer some social rejection because they do not fit in. Another very interesting yes, uh, uh, answer is that of Lee Edelman in No Future. The author cynically outlines the need to kill this child, a metaphor for the hypothetical yet heterosis normative child, fruit of the reproduction of normative models. That is, in the author's own, word, own words, the child aversive, future negating force, answering so well to the inspiriting needs of a moribund familialism. 
With this metaphor, Evelman highlights both the politics and the social constraints that put obstacles to homoparentality and to queer futurity, as if queers were suffering from a death drive and could not project themselves into the future, as if the only possible future when it comes to reproduction was that one of normativities. Because the child, and I quote, because, of the, chi because the child of the heteroreproductive couple stands in at least phantasmatically or phantasma for the redemption of that loss of futurity. The sintomosexual or queers, in um, this is conceptualization to it, who affirms that loss, maintaining it as the empty space, the vacuum at the heart of the symbolic, effectively destroys that child and with, and with it the reality it means to sustain. However, queer's very existence in its multiple shapes and in different levels already puts this phant phantasmagoric compulsively straight child into question. And it is not difficult to affirm that queer motherhood, alongside with other forms of non-normative childbirth <coughs> and rearing, seem to be very frightening. Relational rights regarding LGBT parenting are usually the last ones to be achieved, as mentioned by Santos and Cristina Santos. Reproductive rights as trans people are a battlefield. And in this case, the Spanish example is a quite interesting one. Even when rights are achieved, the socio-cultural context is a very fam in a very familialistic country shows us a wide range of resistance to those rights. In the Spanish case, as I mentioned, before, same-sex marriage and adoption were legalized in 2005 and in 2006 with the law of assisted reproduction, every woman gained access to it regard regardless of marital status or sexual orientation. Yet, in 2007, in an additional provision, provision was added in order to give the rights of maternity to the non-biological mother uh, only if the two women were married which is not mandatory for heterosexual couples. My interviews were very aware of this uh, discrimination and some of them pointed out that they married just because they wanted to avoid a further process of co-adoption by the mother who did not give birth. Let us look at some quotes. This is um, about marriage, F2. And I quote Monica. We had to get married before we had the babies, otherwise we would not have been able to. It would, it would have been more complicated. We would have to make an adoption, but well, we had always thought about getting married. Because for the mother of my girlfriend, that is, the only valid marriage is that in the Catholic Church. In fact, she was trying to avoid by all means that we get married. She wanted us to do a de facto union only. So this is uh, interesting because they really want to do it to show that they could to, to one part of the family. Another case, this is Juana again. Well, the decision to get married, I tell you, it was mainly to avoid problems in registering the child with the surnames of the two of us. And then the law forces you, in our case, to be married because if you don't, you have to start an adoption process which, which is long in time, I suppose, and it, it will always be expensive and unpleasant. And it means to have someone behind you continually to see what life you take, to see with whom you sleep, with whom you live with. Let's look at this paradox. On the one hand, marriage is mandatory for lesbian couples if they want to register the child with both of their surnames being both rec recognized as caregivers. On the other hand, marriage and reproduction are often understood as normative institutions and that is why families reject the idea that their lesbian or bisexual daughters could get married or have children. Those are good examples of the heteronormative society denounced by Hamed and the imposed impossibility of access to some of the social institutions um, that guarantee human futurity question, questioned by a woman. Nevertheless, the difficulties continue. 
My interviews also report some strange situations in clinics or with other health professionals in general, in a much lesser extent, I must say, and essentially in um, civil register offices. And here we have Blanca's example. There was another doctor of whom I was not very fond of. And just the day of the fourth insemination, it's a long and difficult process, um, we arrived and she was in the clinic and not our doctor. And at the beginning, she tells me that my wife could not enter with me when she had always come. About civil registers, offices. You need a certificate saying that you are married, that you have the consent of your wife, so that you can be inseminated or do an in vitro. An incredible amount of paperwork. And before I gave birth, we went to the register office so I could give consent and say, gentlemen, I certify that this lady, who is my wife, is going to come in my name to register our children. Because if I did not, they would not let her register. And yet, she had a lot of problems. It's just that straight people don't have these problems, you know? Even if the fathers are not the biological ones. <coughs> Art has the power to subvert reproduction, but there is also the risk of medicalization, and Chiara yesterday mentioned it, uh, alongside with the normativity. Spanish law is here reinforcing the medicalization and normativity of the reproductive process with people getting married and going to clinics to avoid problems of registration. Who detains the bill power here, recalling Jackie? We can see here how much in the Spanish state, the Spanish state and the law is entering in the intimate decisions of queers and regulating them. Nico Beger denounces that legal texts usually maintain the logic of a heteronormative binary gender system. The Spanish case is a good example of how the law and practices remain under straight monogamous and gendered binary logic that leads to a law that demands more from lesbian couples than from straight ones, as if the first needed to be extra normative, legally speaking, to be recognized as parents. The heterosexual cis normative society feels the hypothetical threat of the hypothetic reproductive queers creating obstacles to that possibility of queer futurity through reproductive rights. Some of the practices of my interviews may well lead to the death of Edelman's metaphorical child and the reality it sustains. Moreover, to protect their children, my interviews are facing many of their fears and are becoming daily basis activists because the new familial arrangements make them more visible than ever. And I think there's a problem here. Yeah. Okay. If coming out to the closet of fam to families of origin was part of their beginnings, before thinking about having children, coming out of the closet at work is sometimes a postpartum process, even if since 2003 a law against labor discrimination went into force. A child kicks you out of the closet, says Raquel. When they were born, she, her partner, said that she was going to have children and she took 15 days of parenting leave because there is no more. That's it, you know? In that sense, when the children were born, she did it and she regretted not having asked for the marriage leave, of course, because when they get married, um, her partner decided not to ask for mar marriage leave in order to keep a little bit more in the closet at work because people are afraid. Even uh, with the law. Human rights violations based on sexual orientation or gender identity are clearly happening in Spain. Queer people are facing constant attempts to impose heterosexual norms and feeling pressure to remain invisible. The quotes used before evidence cultural and legal constraints to the recognition of, the, of individual and, reclaim, and relational rights that are guaranteed in the law. And it is now time to ask, with Paul Preciado, who defends the queer child. The child running away from value discourses. The gender-fluid child. 
the sexual and gender dissidents' children, who stands for them? This is a very open and complex question to answer here, but I would like to leave you with Monica's quote that gives us a simplistic, simplistic but tough clue. And she said at some point, um, while talking about the way they were trying to raise their children, we like our children to play with everything, with dolls, with constructions, cars, whatever. We understand that games have no gender. What we want is them to be what they want in the future. Despite the rights achieved, the persistence of a straight mind based on a normative social contract, which Monique Wittig already spoke about, is very visible. For this reason, lesbian and bisexual motherhood and other forms of parenting outside the normative model, such as parenting through surrogacy, transparenting or polyparenting projects, still generate suspicion and obstacles, according to the extent to which they may seem pervasive to the system sustained by the phantasmagorical projection of the straight child. However, the rejection of those possibilities shows the potential of families outside the norm, Reproducing beyond the heteroreproductive couple, metaphorically mentioned by Edelman, is to refuse to accept the condemnation to a death drive, recreating the figure of the child outside the norms, negotiating a space in the present and necessarily changing the projection of the future that can no longer be the mirror of a compulsory heterosexual past. Fortunately, it begins to be difficult to say that all queer people we know are the children of heterosexuals, and this proves that this futurity begins to be questionable. The future that urges us to end here and now, recalling Edelman's title, is the future of imposed normativities, so that we can negotiate in, it, in its various forms, les, bi, poly, solo, gay, many possible futurities. Thank you.